Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this webinar on uh, GDPR and requirements for cloud providers. Uh, I'm glad you've all been able to uh, join us. Apologies for the very slight uh, delay, but uh, life sometimes has these uh, technical bits of fun. So I'm Alan Calder. I'm your host for the next uh, hour or so. I'm the founder of IT Governance, and uh, it's a business which I set up to be a single source for everything to do with um, IT governance, information security, uh, data protection, and so on. And uh, the background involves uh, writing a number of books, one of which became the Open University textbook for information security. But you can see some of the books there, in particular the GDPR Pocket Guide is uh, one of the books which is making particular uh, waves around uh, helping organizations structure how they deal with GDPR. And as an organization, uh, through our uh, training, uh, consultancy and certification, security testing, software tools, toolkits, books, and so on, we have a very broad and comprehensive set of products and services to help organizations meet information security and GDPR compliance requirements. Today we're going to be covering what GDPR means for cloud service providers. We're going to touch briefly on the rights of data subjects and policies and procedures required by GDPR in respect of cloud processing. We'll look on the uh, design, privacy by design and privacy by default default requirements, the breach notification requirements, some of the impacts of subcontracting on cloud service providers, applicable uh, technical and organizational measures, and then we'll touch on the appropriate uh, implementing, appropriate security controls measures for personally identifiable information in the cloud. And I'm going to touch briefly on another piece of uh, European Union law, which will be relevant to a significant proportion of uh, the um, European Union market, and that's the Network and Information Security Directive. And as you'll see, there is a particular crossover, particularly in terms of cloud service providers between these two bits of regulation. So, top 10 aspects of uh, the regulation, uh, increased fines, uh, as you all know, potential top level of fines is uh, up to 20 million euros or 4% of global turnover, although of course there are lower levels of fines for lower level breaches, but given that those fines apply in particular to extraterritorial transfers of data, um, it's particularly relevant to be aware of for cloud providers. The logic of opt-in and opt-out, the opt -in uh, uh, consent to data processing has to be proactively uh, opted in uh, rather than uh, an opt-out process, so that's another key part as a cloud service processor that you need to be considering. Breach notification, you've got 72 hours as a contractor, as a processor to inform uh, a data controller um, who has to inform the regulator within 72 hours and has to inform users whose information has been breached without undue delay. The challenge for most cloud processes is that the territorial scope of GDPR is uh, all organizations anywhere in the world that are providing services into the European Union uh, and collecting data on EU individuals. You have to comply uh, with GDPR. So that's a significant uh, challenge, particularly as uh, the movement of data outside of the European Union is illegal uh, other than uh, if certain conditions around adequacy of processing environment or other specific uh, obligations are met. Data, data, data subjects have rights, data subjects effectively are in charge, uh, and the impact of GDPR coming into place means that what were 28 separate laws in the European Union become a single law applied across uh, all 28 member states, and this applies also to Britain, uh, certainly up to the point it leaves uh, the European Union and uh, on the face of it will continue applying thereafter as well. Common enforcement, uh, so there's a consistency mechanism which means that the way in which GDPR is enforced in all member states will be consistent and there's the opportunity for uh, individuals to band together uh, and bring actions against cloud processors or against data controllers uh, as well as obviously doing them uh, doing that themselves. GDPR comes into effect across the EU from the 25th of May uh, 2018, uh, and it's worth noticing that administrative penalties, the up to 20 million euros, the key words in the regulation are that penalties must be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive, which means um, really uh, if we're finding one organization, we'd like that to dissuade other organizations from doing what they were doing. 
Now, as we go through uh, the next 45 minutes or so, uh, you're probably going to find you have questions. Please do use the uh, question, uh, question function to type questions in. I'll pick them up uh, all afterwards and I'll read questions out and then give you the answers uh, as quickly as I can. I'm going to talk for about 40 or 45 minutes um, and then I'll be dealing with the questions that, uh, that you have for me. So, very briefly a look at the data protection model under GDPR. It starts with the idea that uh, data subjects, that's you and me, are individuals, we have rights. Um, and we agree that data controllers, typically organizations, may collect our information, but if they do, they have duties uh, to look after that data in a certain way. If the data controller processes the information, processing means you know whatever it's doing with it, using it, storing it, transmitting it, um, then it's also the processor, but it might uh, contract with a third party to process that information and quite often uh, cloud organizations fall into the group of organizations called data processors uh, and quite often cloud organizations are operating across multiple countries. So the way in which GDPR addresses uh, third countries is important. Third parties uh, is dealing with interests of third parties in uh, personal data. GDPR looks at that relationship as well and uh, is very clear about the powers of regulators, the Information Commissioner in the United Kingdom, but the regulatory authorities in all the member states to enforce uh, GDPR on the uh, on data controllers and processors um, and the uh, activity of the Information Commissioner is overseen by the European Data Protection Board whose role is to ensure consistency in the European Union. A key uh, obligation for processors and controllers is around the security of data, ensuring that it can't be accessed by those who are not entitled to have it. Uh, data subjects are entitled to uh, bring complaints to the regulator as well as to courts, uh, and the regulators very clearly have an assessment uh, and enforcement role. So it's a very comprehensive uh, model, and uh, as a cloud processor, one is potentially both a data controller as well as a data subject. So one, one needs to address the issues from that perspective. If you're a data controller or a processor and you're providing services into the European Union, but you're not yourself established in the European Union, GDPR requires that you appoint a controller, sorry, you appoint a representative based inside uh, the Union. So you can't uh, hide behind the fact that you're based in um, uh, Russia or China or the United States, uh, and therefore it's difficult for a data subject to uh, exercise their rights. You have to formally appoint a representative uh, established in the European Union where the processing or profiling is taking place and that representative has to have a mandate to uh, be addressed by data subjects as well as by supervisory authorities. And clearly the territorial scope of GDPR is all organizations that are providing services into uh, the European Union irrespective of where they are based in the world. GDPR is built around the idea of the rights of data subjects, and data subjects uh, have rights to consent to the processing of their information, they have a right to uh, access it, to rectify uh, inaccurate or incorrect data, to have uh, information which is no longer relevant, erased or forgotten, and they can restrict processing while uh, they're arguing uh, with a controller or processor over the accuracy or otherwise, and of course they can also object to processing. The objection could include an objection to having data deleted because they have a reason why they see the data should be put in place. Not only do data subjects have those rights, it's now a legal obligation for controllers and processors to ensure that data subjects know they have those rights and to facilitate the exercise of those rights. So in collecting data and getting consent, you have to say clearly to data subjects, this is what you're consenting to. Um, if you don't consent to it, these are the consequences. Um, you have a right to withdraw consent at any time, which um, let's be clear, means that uh, however easy it was to consent, and consent has to be positive and proactive, a um, uh, consent by default will be illegal, uh, they have to be able to withdraw consent as easily. So if you give consent by ticking a box on a website, then you have to be able to withdraw consent by ticking a box on a website. Uh, data subjects also have the right to lodge a complaint and the right to be informed of any automated decision making, including profiling if that's taking place. So, the, as I said, data subjects very much are in control. 
as a controller, uh, irrespective of whether you are uh, in the cloud or otherwise, uh, you have to ensure that you're processing data lawfully, which means that the data gave specific consent to the processing for a specific purpose, um, and that while there are other specific circumstances where uh, consent is not required, such as in the public interest and so on, the key issue is that as a as a, as a cloud-based uh, processor, you're almost certainly providing services to organizations who've had to enter into obligations with their data subjects, which would include um, providing access to information which has been collected, the data controller, and where your customer is the data controller uh, and where you are the data controller in respect uh, of services you provide or your own staff, uh, you have to be able to respond to requests from data subjects within one month uh, for information about whatever you hold on them uh, and you can't make a charge for that. GDPR clearly distinguishes between controllers and processors for the first time. There are clearly identified obligations and data controllers and controllers are organizations who collect information or who determine how collected information is to be used, uh, have to ensure that any processors with whom they contract uh, operate in line with the contract. So processors uh, and that applies if you're providing uh, um, infrastructure as a service, platform or software as a service, you're a processor, um, or potentially a processor for another organization, you need to make sure that you're processing data under an explicit contract from the data controller, and insofar as you yourself are a data controller, you need to have explicit permission from data subjects for what you're going to deal with the data. As I said, consent has to be clear and affirmative. Uh, silence or inactivity is not consent, and therefore if you don't have consent, you're processing data illegally, um, and uh, where you're collecting, where you're dealing with uh, children, uh, you have to be aware of the fact that children, by default, cannot consent to processing personal information. A child is defined in GDPR as a natural human being under the age of 16, although member states do have the power to vary that anywhere between 13 and 16. And that means that if you're an organization providing services which are likely to be of interest to children, uh, you have the immediate issue that children are not able to consent, not legally able to consent to you uh, giving them, uh, giving you their data or processing their data. You have to have in place mechanisms for ensuring that um, an appropriate adult, and that is an appropriate adult, is able to give you the consent that you need. Processing any information from a uh, from a child that uh, which you don't have permission to process would be a uh, uh, would be illegal. Sensitive personal information and sensitive personal information includes uh, race, ethnic origin, gender, biometric data, uh, and so on. Uh, you need explicit consent to process. So uh, what the law says, it's prohibited to process this data unless you have explicit permission to do that. And the explicit permission has to be very clear about what the information is, how it's going to be processed, what it's going to be used for, who it's going to be shared with, in such a way that the data subject is able to be uh, clear in making a decision as to whether to agree with it or not. You're under an obligation to secure data that you process, both as a controller and as a processor against accidental loss or damage. That's an Article 5 requirement of GDPR. As a controller, it's incumbent on you to ensure that any processor with whom you contract is also going to observe that requirement. So if you're simply a cloud-based processor, you're a software as a service or providing some other service to an organization where the organization itself is dealing with data subjects, so could be an email provider, for instance, um, you have to have a legal contract with the organization that you're contracting with, uh, which sets out exactly what you can do. And you need to make sure that your processing is carried out entirely in line with the documented contract you have with the data controller. What that practically means for many uh, cloud-based controllers is you'll want to create model clauses uh, which go into the contract that you, not only that you give to your customers, but which you ask your customers to put into contracts with their customers to ensure that there is uh, clarity about consent all the way through the uh, chain. If you decide to use another processor, that needs to be agreed to by the data subject. It needs to be subject to each of the stages, um, and at each of the stages, appropriate technical and organizational measures need to be in place to ensure the security of the 
information and the processing of the information of the data subject. At the end of a contract, the data processor has to return all of the personal data to the controller or be able to demonstrate that it's been appropriately deleted and has to help the controller demonstrate compliance with the regulation, providing any information necessary to do so. And that's where I want Uh, there may have been a brief moment there where you can't hear me. Something happened on my set. Hopefully you can now hear me again. Uh, let me just go briefly back. The Network and Information Security uh, Directive, which came into place, which comes into place in May 2018, will apply to cloud service providers just as it applies to um, it's just as GDPR applies to cloud service providers, so you've got to nominate a representative, you fall under the jurisdiction of the state in which you have a representative, and administrative penalties need to be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. And so that means that if you're breached uh, in terms of personal data that you're storing as a cloud service provider, you could find yourself dealing uh, simultaneously with a um, uh, an administrative fine under GDPR and an administrative fine under the Network and Information Security Directive. So think of yourself as being obliged to have in place appropriate technical and organizational measures appropriate to the risks as a cloud services provider with uh, relevant network and information security um, uh, protection, minimize the impact of incidents, so an incident management procedure, business continuity management services to ensure continuity of your cloud-based services, and the ability to assess the security of your system, so documented security policy, um, security audits carried out by competent authorities or auditors. All of those are going to be network and information security directed requirements. So it's worthwhile as you think about GDPR compliance to think about how do we ensure that simultaneously we're going to meet the requirements of the network and information security directives. And for most organizations, the challenge of operating in the cloud is pretty substantial because individuals inside the organization could be using any one of a number of cloud services. Uh, you as an organization may or may not have contracted with the cloud service provider. You need to think about which cloud service providers you give your staff access to and the terms on which you do so, uh, where it's a corporate contract, where, for instance, you use LinkedIn as part of your corporate marketing relationship. You'll need to think about whether 
there is a corporate contract between your organization and LinkedIn and if so you'll need to work out uh, with LinkedIn what processing they can do and that'll probably come in the other way around of LinkedIn saying here are the model terms that we put into any relationship we have with you. So the range of cloud-based services that an organization we're using is pretty substantial and that's where you get the next area of challenge because many cloud-based services store data wherever is appropriate globally. GDPR says that the information of data subjects, personal information of data subjects can only be transferred out to the European Union on the basis of adequacy and adequacy is a specific set of requirements um, around uh, rule of law uh, and outside the European Union the list of countries which don't meet the requirements is much longer than the list of countries that do. So America does not, Australia does not, um, New Zealand, Uruguay, Argentina, the Channel Islands do, um, Canada, Ireland, sorry, Canada, Switzerland do, and that's kind of about it. Any other country in the world doesn't meet the adequacy requirements. And that means that it's illegal for a for an organization to transfer data, and that includes uh, with a cloud-based service provider outside the European Union, unless the cloud-based service provider can demonstrate that it's got in place um, appropriate, as inside an organization, binding corporate rules, or appropriate standard model clauses, which ensure that uh, the data will be protected in a way uh, that it would be protected inside the European Union. So that's already a set of requirements. There's nothing new under GDPR. Data Protection Act already has those requirements. So what that should mean for cloud service providers right now, if you're providing services into the European Union, is the option ought to be available for you with your customers for them to determine whether uh, they want to allow you to transfer data outside of the European Union or not. Many larger cloud service providers already have that option available. Um, where you make it available and you allow people to choose to transfer data outside the European Union, you need to make sure as a cloud service provider that you can demonstrate that you are protecting data in a way that is adequate and is going to meet the European Union data protection requirements. That's particularly important once GDPR comes into place because, um, as I said, GDPR breaches of the international transfer requirements carry the highest level of fines, not the lowest level of fines. And here's the rub. If you're breached, GDPR requires you to report it. Up till now across the European Union, there's been no legal obligation in most countries, in all countries, to report a data breach. It's a good practice thing to happen. From the 25th of May 2018, it will be a legal obligation. So as soon as you're aware of being breached, you've got 72 hours to uh, report it to your regulator. If you're a processor and you've been breached, you have to tell the controller as quickly as you can. Um, ideally, the controller is looking to know within 72 hours because that's how long they've got to report. And if it takes you longer to do that, then you've got to explain why your systems weren't good enough. And if you bear in mind that some of the conditions for levying uh, fines are um, the efficiency of your, your systems, the uh, negligence or otherwise of your management approach to security, an inability to recognize that you've been breached would be taken as an example, if you like, of negligence. So um, in, uh, in a way, reported today is the uh, in a number of our, a number of uh, journals uh, breach in a UK company sports direct where its um, personnel management um, uh, database was breached the record of some 30,000 members of staff were apparently exposed it was the breach was the result of an unpatched uh, piece of software uh, while the Information Commission was told some time ago uh, the breach apparently took place uh, at, in autumn last year and staff are only, it appears, learning from uh, national press uh, at the moment that their data was breached. Under GDPR, um, the failure to inform the regulator quickly, uh, the fact that you didn't breach your systems, those would be evidence of negligence um, and the uh, uh, reality that the data of so many data subjects was breached and apparently wasn't encrypted would also mean that you'd have to inform all the data subjects without delay as to the risks to them of uh, what the exposure of their data might mean. So the impact on organizations when they're breached is uh, very significant. It's a bit like um, if you're breached, uh, you contact the regulator and say, okay, we screwed up, how much do you want to fine us? Uh, you can avoid those things by um, having really good 
uh, incident response processes, really good data breach response processes, uh, good monitoring, you've taken good steps to comply with GDPR, you've got uh, external certifications uh, in place, um, and you've got a really good privacy compliance framework. And we touched on the idea of organizational and administrative measures, the requirement that uh, organizations do put in place uh, a method of demonstrating that you've taken appropriate action to meet the requirements of GDPR. And that's a combination of a governance framework that looks at the risk to the rights uh, of data subjects, uh, that looks at compliance with GDPR and feeds that down through a structure of policies, uh, procedures, information security, controls and records of how those have worked, all of which reflects the privacy principles, the principles around the uh, lawfulness of processing, the idea that data should only be processed uh, for as long as is necessary and only for the purposes agreed, and so on. So a privacy compliance framework is a key part for any cloud-based organization, whether controller or processor, uh, to meet its obligations. And in that kind of framework, uh, you'd want to be clear about roles and responsibilities, so board responsibility, uh, senior management responsibility perhaps a director responsible for um, uh, data security, a senior manager, a data protection officer or data protection team. Uh, you'd want to have a uh, mechanism for monitoring, testing and auditing compliance with your privacy framework. That's a kind of rough idea of the range of policies and procedures that as an organization you might need to have in place, or driven by a data protection policy but flows down through uh, requirements around how you address uh, information security, risk management, uh, subject access, uh, data retention, all of those are components of putting in place an appropriate uh, set of organizational measures to ensure that you're complying with the requirements of GDPR. Uh, technical measures uh, might flow through into uh, looking practically at what you're actually doing with data, so uh, current data sets and services, remembering that your own employees are data subjects and you need to be protecting the data of your own employees in exactly the same way as uh, you're protecting the data of uh, those data subjects that uh, either as a controller or as a processor um, you're dealing with. If you are uh, deploying cloud-based services or apps as a control or process, you need to make sure that you've got appropriate rules in place uh, to protect them. In-app services, if they're designed for instance for a children's market, you need to make sure you have well-tested and robust processes for establishing that the consent you're getting is from uh, people who are legally old enough to uh, give consent. Uh, you need to uh, make sure that you've got a method of identifying risks of uh, changes in risk environments. Uh, you'd want to have good uh, monitoring, data loss prevention, anomaly uh, uh, checking uh, processes and software in place to make sure that you're identifying evolving uh, threats inside your cloud environment. Uh, there might be a number of ways in which as a cloud processor you want to integrate with um, customer single sign-on services and others so that you can simplify the way in which uh, authorized users authenticate to access information. Remember that whether you're a processor or a controller, uh, you have joint and several liability under the GDPR for the protection of the information of data subjects. What that should lead to is a situation where uh, most organizations are uh, publishing lists of approved cloud services, cloud services who meet their security requirements, who um, are able to demonstrate um, geographic restrictions of processing, for instance, uh, and that any requests for new cloud services are pushed through a review process which ensures that uh, there is an appropriate contractual framework, an appropriate processing framework in place for all of those cloud service providers. So it's a significant set of shifts. Uh, the cloud was meant to provide a simple, straightforward, easy environment in which uh, organizations and individuals could share and uh, um, process data. GDPR makes that significantly more complicated. The business of certifications, though, does uh, make the challenge of working out how to demonstrate that you've taken due care much easier to uh, to meet. So, uh, given that GDPR says that uh, all organisations have to demonstrate appropriate administrative um, 
uh, and organizational measures to uh, comply with the uh, principle six requirement to protect uh, personal information, the question becomes how on earth would we demonstrate this? If we're breached, and bear in mind that with breaches it's not a case of if but when, if we're breached, how do we demonstrate that in spite of the fact, how do we demonstrate that we're breached in spite of the fact that we were doing the right thing? And the answer is uh, codes of conduct and certifications. GDPR says that you can use um, certifications to recognize national or international standards or to approve codes of conduct to indicate that you've taken uh, due and appropriate steps to meet your compliance requirements. BS 1012, a standard being developed in Britain for personal information management systems, uh, might be one such national standard for uh, uh, if it becomes a standard against which you can be audited for demonstrating compliance with GDPR. ISO 27001, um, which works, as I'll show you in a minute, with another standard, ISO 27018, is a certification standard which meets GDPR requirements around independence and uh, of certification mechanisms um, for dealing with information security. So uh, putting in place a management system which is capable of um, uh, certification against one of those standards is a very good way of demonstrating compliance. At a simpler level, uh, the Cyber Essentials uh, framework, which is a set of five basic controls originally designed for smaller organizations um, and uh, certification against which should be a relatively low cost activity is a starting point for all organizations, whereas ISO 27001 is a slightly greater level of maturity. We'll also touch on in a minute the cloud controls matrix, which is potentially a practical way in which organizations can address in the cloud an appropriate uh, broad-based security uh, mechanism. There will be new standards emerging, new privacy seals come out across the European Union over the course of the next uh, few years. Remember that GDPR comes into force on the 25th of May uh, 2018, so um, we are about 14 or 15 months away from it coming uh, into effect. There are no existing privacy seals, but uh, there are some under development. So you have to keep an eye on uh, regulator sites, information commissioner sites, IT governance sites, and so on to see where new information emerges. The key thing, though, is that demonstrating that you're in compliance with one of these standards does not absolve you of your accountability to actually do the thing right. So it's a way of demonstrating that you made best efforts, but it's not proof of compliance. GDPR is a law, and so um, uh, it will be argued over in law courts for years to come exactly what particular terms and so on mean will be argued over in law courts. So the practical approach for organizations right now is to determine how do we keep out of trouble. Um, part of the way of doing that is compliance to international standards um, and certifications of compliance as a way of demonstrating we've done appropriate things around security. If you're operating in the cloud, uh, one of two uh, matrix two uh, frameworks is probably an appropriate framework to use. The first is the cloud controls matrix, CCM version 3, which you can download from the Cloud Security Alliance website. So if you type Cloud Security Alliance into your browser, it will take you to a website. Um, it's a freely available uh, standard. It's a very comprehensive set of controls, which as you can see, uh, deals with all of the key areas that a cloud services provider might need to deal with. Uh, it includes data center security, information lifecycle management, it includes governance um, and risk management, virtualization, interoperability, mobile security, incident management, and all of that. Very comprehensive, very thorough uh, standard, uh, very practical place for an organization uh, to go. It doesn't have the same uh, simplicity of certification scheme as ISO 27001, which I'll touch on in a minute. Um, it does have an emerging, uh, it already exists, but it's not that widely used yet, certification scheme called C-STAR, um, and hopefully over the course of the next few years, either in combination with ISO 27001 or on its own CCM version 3 will become a much better established framework for uh, cloud-based organizations to demonstrate compliance with the security requirements of GDPR. The other option, as I mentioned, is ISO 27001, which is an information security management system standard. It's um, a combination of a set of requirements, how to manage information security, dealing with uh, governance through 
um, uh, roles and responsibilities, top management, commitment, um, training, and so on. Um, and it's a set of controls which are listed in an annex to ISO 27001. And there are 114 controls across 18 control categories, which, as you can see, start with information security policies um, and work their way through to compliance. Uh, that's a very comprehensive and solid set of controls, which now um, probably 30 or 40,000 organizations around the world have successfully implemented and been certified against. The International Standards Organization published a standard ISO 27018, um, which is a specific set of controls for cloud-based organizations. And it's made up really of uh, minor amendments and extensions to the uh, controls 5 through 18, which were already listed there, plus an additional set of uh, specifically cloud-related controls to deal with um, uh, geographic scope, territorial uh, processing permissions, uh, and all of those kind of areas. And it's increasingly possible with certification bodies to get a certificate of compliance to ISO 27001 and ISO 27018 as a scope extension. And for many organizations for whom ISO 27001 has been a practical way to proceed because of the uh, very wide range of um, uh, existing support bodies and institutions that there are to help compliance, 27,018 becomes a practical mechanism to uh, extend your demonstration of security compliance to cover uh, what you're doing in the cloud as well. But information security compliance, what you're really trying to do with information security compliance is to make sure that you stay uh, out of trouble. It's meeting the um, Article 6, sorry, the Principle 6 set of requirements that you demonstrate um, uh, that you're able to secure personal information, but you've still got to go and do all of the things either as a processor or a controller, which ensure that uh, as a processor you're processing information in compliance with the contractual uh, obligations entered into uh, by your data controllers, and as a controller that you've got lawful and legal consent uh, to process that information. There are, of course, a range of resources available to you, uh, either if you're tackling uh, GDPR compliance on a self-help basis uh, on our website, uh, and if you're looking for consultant support or uh, more focused uh, guidance uh, and activity, again, there's a range of services which we can give organizations around uh, management of GDPR compliance and information security. But as I said, it's GDPR itself, the um, uh, lawful consent, lawful processing is the core of how cloud processors have to approach uh, their information security obligations in the world, which starts in May 2018. So, ladies and gentlemen, that brings me to the point of requesting any questions that uh, you'd like to ask. Happy to pick up and respond to uh, questions on any part of what uh, we've been talking about. Um, so, just type questions into the uh, chat function. In just a moment, I'll be starting to pick up uh, questions and respond to them. Um, I'm inevitably not going to be able to deal with all of them, and so um, really just to be uh, clear, because it'll be asked quite a lot, the um, slides and the audio will be available probably within about 48 hours to everybody who's been uh, on the uh, on the course, so um, yes is the answer to all of those who've asked that uh, question. Uh, the slides, yeah, current DPA principle for controls around transferring data still apply under GDPA. Yes, the, the same basic principles apply, that's exactly uh, correct. Um, the transfer of data outside of the EEA has to be subject to the rule of adequacy or subject to uh, binding corporate rules or subject to um, the um, uh, standard, standard model clauses. Good example of uh, third parties, uh, an organization that, uh, for instance, is processing um, uh, pay payroll data um, uh, and uh, is contracting then with another information to provide uh, payroll services, transferring uh, payroll data to a bank. That would be a third party working with a payroll processing bureau. 
Um, another third party might be uh, an organization which, for instance, is providing um, CV uh, assessment services, uh, CV screening services where uh, data subjects are providing their information and the information is being screened against an original uh, database. Um, processes are different from third parties. Processes are different from third parties in the sense that uh, processes are processing information under a specific contract from a uh, data controller. Um, they're not dealing with the information because it was um, collected by them, so a third party under the circumstance might be a reseller of uh, data protection, sorry, of um, mailing lists. Uh, that would be a third party reselling information. Um, they're not necessarily processing information under contract from a data controller. So processes in this context are very specifically organizations processing data under contract from a data controller. The right to be forgotten. Um, the uh, right to be forgotten is um, uh, limited by the extent to which organizations might have to retain information to meet other legal or contractual obligations. So there is a defense against uh, raising information um, that, for instance, let's say you're an insurance company and if somebody says, I'd like you to forget me, uh, you'd say, actually, I have a contract to provide cover for 10 years beyond the date on which you sold the house. Um, and so in order to do that, I have to, to meet my contractual obligations to continue to uh, retain this data. So there are exceptions to the right to uh, be forgotten, um, and it's important to bear in mind that the exercise of it needs to be um, appropriate. It's designed to be where the processing of the data is no longer um, in line with the original permission that was given or granted, um, and therefore um, it seems uh, unreasonable for the data controller to continue retaining data. Uh, understanding the definition of data transfer includes just accessing the data by viewing it on a com computer screen. If this is done, say, via VPN link, is this currently considered viewing? If somebody can view the data, they can view the data however they do it. Um, I think there will be arguments once GDPR comes into force as to exactly where the boundary between transfer of data out of the European Union uh, to be processed technically or logistically in another country is different from it stays inside the European Union but somebody can view it uh, over a VPN link comes into uh, account. That will be a legal uh, argument. The logical approach right now is to assume that uh, if you're going to allow people to access the information from abroad, uh, from outside the European Union, they could potentially write it down um, so that that then potentially is a risk to the rights of data subjects. So uh, I would suggest that you treat uh, viewing in the same way as you treat any other processing outside of the European Union. Uh, as a cloud provider, we're a data processor for the data we host and the systems that we provide to our customers. As a data controller, we use some Microsoft platforms to run certain elements, but these are not cloud-based. Do Microsoft therefore become a data processor for our business as we use the security elements of these products, therefore making them in some way responsible for the security of our data? If you're using Microsoft uh, products inside your organization, in other words, not as part of a Microsoft platform, then you're responsible for the deployment of products you purchase or rent or deploy inside your organization. If you're deploying Microsoft products because you're buying their services in the cloud, um, the Microsoft is potentially a processor and should be operating under contract uh, from you and uh, you would expect Microsoft to be telling you here are the model clauses. If not, you should certainly be talking to them about the basis on which uh, they're going to be processing data. Uh, would we please precise scope? GD, G, GDPR concerns services provided to citizens of the EU. Does it mean residents of the EU or EU citizens residing outside the EU? So the way GDPR is structured is it says that organizations providing services in or into the European Union have to comply with the GDPR. That means irrespective of whether the data they gather inside the European Union is of EU citizens or non-EU citizens, uh, you have to comply with GDPR in respect to the services you provide. And therefore, all of the, um, and the scope of um, GDPR is natural persons. Anybody inside the European Union whose data you have collected has the same rights. Um, the, the difference in a way comes if a EU citizen is 
traveling, let's say, uh, on their own steam outside the European Union, happens to buy a product or service from a, an organization in a, another country, that doesn't instantly force that organization to comply with GDPR because they're not providing services into uh, GDPR in the first place. Yeah, we had some silence apologies. So I'm just going through, thank you everybody, telling me you lost audio. Can an organization require its employees to use uh, LinkedIn uh, as a workplace? Uh, you can't require employees to share their data. Data subjects have rights. Um, you can uh, enter into agreements with them about what they might do. You can enter into agreements with them which are specific about how they can and can't interact with um, any uh, brand or brand activity that you have um, and setting out rules for people and how they represent you in social media uh, environments would be one of the ways in which you do that. Um, you're entitled, perfectly entitled to say that in uh, LinkedIn, in representing the company on LinkedIn, these are the rules, this is what you must do and if you fail to do that we retain the right to uh, take disciplinary action. The same thing would apply to uh, Facebook or any other environment. You, um, uh, uh, you, you, you can't force them to use or not use, you can't force them to to hand their data over or not hand their data over. Um, you can, I think, say to uh, a member of staff that one of the ways in which if they've joined your marketing team, uh, we communicate with um, our audiences through LinkedIn that they need to be happy that that means they're going to have to agree with LinkedIn to sharing certain amounts of personal data. Um, if they choose not to do that, which they're entitled to do, you're not going to employ them able to employ them as a data subject. So telling somebody what the consequences are of not giving uh, consent is a reasonable thing to do. There is no difference between business to business and business to consumer in GDPR. The regulation simply says um, that personal data has to be protected in a uh, given way um, and uh, therefore you need to deal with it consistently in all of those ways. The only um, variation is, if you like, where uh, a data subject has already published their information and it's in the public environment. And arguably, if a chief executive's name and contact details, for instance, are in the public environment, it's difficult for him or her to claim that this data, this specific data, is now subject to uh, some form of protection. Other of their specific data, of course, might be, and you may have to uh, be clear about um, how that would be dealt with. Uh, you're a software house that builds bespoke web-based systems for SMEs in the UK, utilize major cloud service providers for database and storage provision. What are our responsibilities under GDPR? Um, well, first of all, uh, you have employees, so you're a data controller in respect of your employees. Um, you're a software house. The web-based systems which you're building uh, will go into uh, deployment by SMEs. So SMEs will be customers. They'll be uh, processing personal information in there. So I would expect that your SME customers will contractually require you to demonstrate that you've applied good practices around securing the software you've developed, particularly around the processing of personal information such that when they deploy your software, they can rely on the fact that the personal information of data subjects has been appropriately protected. Uh, how do we envisage data responsibility obligations shaping up for child app games that are distributed via an app store? Um, a, well, it's kind of going to depend on the rules of the app store. Um, <coughs> GDPR doesn't uh, say it's the responsibility of the app store to make sure that children uh, don't get asked to or don't try and give permission. It's the uh, responsibility of the data controller. So it'll be the obligation of the data controller to establish whether the App Store is effectively blocking access to children. If it's not, um, it'll be the uh, responsibility of the data controller to ensure that they are um, getting permission from an appropriate uh, adult uh, in respect of processing that child's data. Um, and that's all going to be quite complicated because one of the variations under GDPR is that member states can determine that the uh, age of a child is anywhere between 13 and 16. So you could have 
three or four states saying the age is 13, another one 14, others 15 or 16. And while uh, that age of consent to processing of personal data will be related only to processing of personal data, of course it doesn't apply to any other legal consents. So whatever other legal consents um, are allowed in particular jurisdictions, those are unaffected. This is simply around the processing of data. So there are complications for uh, organizations in thinking about um, how you're going to deal with getting consent from children. Um, ISO 27001, uh, so how does that help meet GDPR requirements? The specific requirement in GDPR is that organizations take appropriate technical and organizational measures to protect the confidentiality, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of personal information. Your challenge as an organization is, particularly if you're breached, how do you demonstrate that you took appropriate steps to do so? And the first part of the answer is um, to get certification to an international standard such as ISO uh, 27001. It's the only standard there is for only international standard for information security management systems that's commonly available. So compliance with it would indicate that you took appropriate steps to meet your security obligations. ISO 27001 doesn't explicitly deal with uh, data in a cloud environment, and the ISO organization published an additional standard, ISO 27018, which provides additional cloud-specific controls. And so you could, by extending the controls you selected for ISO 27001 to include those in ISO 27018, demonstrate that your uh, compliance framework is um, sectorally cloud specific and that would be an effective mechanism for demonstrating that um, you've uh, endeavored to, you've taken steps to meet your obligations to protect information. What about consent for unstructured data? We provide cloud contact sector solutions. Do we need a consent for the call recordings as well? Um, if you're making call recordings and the call recordings enable you to identify human beings, then those call recordings need to be protected. Um, uh, if you bear in mind that some apps and services are now moving towards voice identification as the most effective method of identifying and authenticating human beings, you can see how significant that might be. So uh, recording telephone calls, I think your planning should be that uh, those records need to be secured and that when you get a subject access request, you need to be able to search those records as well uh, in order to tell the data subject that you've collected that uh, information. Um, can a well-written end user license agreement pass the liability on customers' use of a cloud service. In other words, how do I uh, avoid being responsible for breach of a customer's infrastructure? Um, and I think that's perfectly reasonable. As a cloud provider, you would want to be clear that the boundary of uh, your responsibility ends uh, at the point where you no longer have effect control over what happens. So, um, for instance, as a platform, as a service provider, you would want to say that we provide security only in respect of the platform, not in respect of uh, the software that you're running. As a SaaS provider, you'd want to say we provide uh, compliance, sorry, we provide um, security only in response or in, in relation to the processing on the system of the data, but the human access to it, that's your problem, you have to deal with them. That's a perfectly reasonable way to clarify where the scope boundary is between what you as a cloud processor are uh, responsible for and what the controller is responsible for. Bear in mind that the controller um, technically has to ensure that as a processor you're processing data only in accordance with their specific written instructions. So um, getting in place as a processor uh, instructions that you want to get given is going to be an important part of your customer engagement process. Um, you're an ISO 27001 accredited software house. Um, if you're providing services into the cloud um, or cloud-based services, then 27018 would probably apply. It's very specifically for protection of personally identifiable information in the cloud. So um, any uh, software which is around um, um, delivering PII in the cloud or any related stuff, 27,018 applies. If you're not sure, go and have a look at it. You can get an extract from the ISO website which will uh, give you a sense of the difference. Um, help orient us regarding the difference between the Privacy Shield and GDPR. Um, so 
uh, the Privacy Shield is just a method by which an organization can claim to comply with GDPR and still be based in the US. Uh, because the US doesn't meet the adequacy requirements, uh, i.e. it doesn't have a, 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 a national or a federal level data processing law, um, it doesn't meet the European Union's adequacy requirements. Um, the one way for a US organization to process data is to claim that it complies currently with the Data Protection Directive and after May 2018 with the GDPR and in so claiming um, it can claim a safe harbor or more particularly to be shielded under the EU US Privacy Shield because it's registered with the um, uh, Federal Trade Commission, uh, it's put in place mechanisms to en enable it to be sued for data subjects to take um, action against it to protect their uh, individual rights. So um, it's, it's, not, it's a mechanism for demonstrating that you're in compliance with the GDPR. Um, it goes with GDPR or with DPD at the moment, it's not an instead of. Um, when we talk about reporting breaches to the regulator, as a data processor you report breaches to your controller um, and the controller reports breaches to the regulator. The controller has 72 hours to report a breach uh, to the regulator. Um, you have to report as a data processor breaches as quickly as possible uh, to the controller and given the controller's obligation one would imagine controllers will want to know that uh, any data processors they contract with are able to tell them very quickly what's uh, going on. Which body do data processors controllers get certified with? If you're going for ISO 27001 certification, you choose your own certification body. Um, there are national certifi accredited certification bodies like uh, BSI, TUV, um, uh, LRQA, uh, BVQI, uh, and any numbers. If you go to the National Accreditation uh, Board in the, in, the, in the UK, that's UCAS, it will list certification bodies who are accredited for ISO 27001 uh, certification. Those are the people to be talking to about certification of your management system. Uh, binding corporate rules are rules put in place and there's model clauses which the GDPR, which the Information Commissioner can point you at, um, which uh, are binding on subsidiaries of international companies and ensure that data transferred around inside international organizations will be protected in line with the requirements of the Data Protection uh, Act. Um, we're kind of coming to the end of time we've got, so I'm just going to pick a couple more uh, questions. There are many more questions than uh, we deal with. What if you process on global websites, e.g. chat, and the in-scope data such as email address is not really tied to the EU, could be an American visiting a UK website? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, the answer is the American visiting the UK website. The UK website is um, are responsible for protecting the data of anybody from anywhere in the world um, who is accessing services inside the European Union. So the UK website has to protect that data irrespective of where the data subject is. If you're a chat website um, and you're now supporting that activity and you're based, let us say, in Russia, um, you've got and you're operating under contract, you're a data processor and operating under a contract with the UK website, then I think the way that works is that you need to um, be processing that data under a clear contract from the um, EU controller because you're a processor, um, you're outside the European Union, you need to seek a method of, uh, of compliance that would be some form of standard contract clause. GDPR brings a whole bunch of terrific challenges. Will the regs apply to a job board if I store my C on its server. Um, the job board, the company operating the job board is a data controller. It's collecting your information. It should say to you, in storing your information here, this is what we're going to do with it. This is who we're going to make available to it. This is how we're going to protect it. As a data subject, you're entitled to uh, be given all of that information before you consent to it. Uh, and so, yes, in simple terms, the job board is responsible for protecting your data under um, uh, in terms of uh, GDPR. Um, last couple of questions. If there is an overriding uh, legal obligation elsewhere, uh, then yes, it might uh, require you to collect data which a data subject doesn't want you to or GDPR says you can't and thrashing out those obligations is going to take some uh, specific time for organizations as well. Um, and uh, 
Final question, what attitudes have we seen in organizations so far that hinder uptake of this regulation? Um, and mostly when we're talking to organizations, it's organizations who really recognize they need to do something. So um, the broader answer to that is what hinders uptake is organizations haven't yet got their head around the fact that uh, GDPR is serious. The possibility of data subjects bringing actions against you combined with the possibility of administrative fines and the requirements on you to uh, report breaches to uh, regulators within 72 hours means that it ought to be on the risk register of every organization uh, is the practical reality. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're well out of time. Apologies for the couple of um, uh, technical issues. Thank you all very much for being here. I believe that um, there will be a continuing, there is a continuing series of webinars. Uh, hopefully you'll join us for some of those on particular uh, GDPR related subjects. But um, uh, as I said, the slides will be, uh, slides and recording will be available um, and we're busy gathering uh, anonymizing and gathering questions together and trying to create a very substantial data bank, bank which we'll update over time and make available. So thank you all very much for being here today. I wish you success with the rest of whatever you're planning for today. Goodbye.